You want to start the recording? Thank okay. you. All right. And then I will share my screen. And we can get this day started. So thank you everybody for being here. It is October in case you get lost in what month it is sometimes like I do. So this is the October version of the JVS online uh, journal club. We're thrilled to have the University of Washington um, and also the University of Utah where I was a fellow to be hosting this evening. And we have two very interesting articles. Um, trans carotid revascularization is safe and next with anatomic hostility for carotid endarterectomy or with anatomic anyway. And then trends in annual open abdominal aortic surgical volumes for vascular trainees compared with annual national volumes in the endovascular era. And we're happy to have Dr. Um, Elizabeth George and Dr. Jason Lee. And then um, from Dr. Keith or uh, Dr. Wang is also here for the product paper. Um, Again, speaking of our uh, groups, the University of Utah, Dr. Mark Sarfati, Associate Professor of Surgery, and Dr. Ethan Rosenfeld, who is their first year vascular fellow, will be presenting Dr. Jake Hemingway from the University of Washington, who I will forever, ever think is a fourth year medical student because that's when I remember him. And um, also thrilled to have uh, Dr. G Amir Ghaffarian, who's their graduating, uh, integrated resident, if you're looking for a new partner, we were just talking about he's looking for a job. From the University of Texas in Houston, uh, Dr. Wang um, is here to answer questions about the carotid article. And then again, Dr. Jason Lee and Dr. Lizzie George. Dr. George is also a faculty now, and I will forever remember her as a resident, but I'm trying to adapt as the time from Stanford will be going over the endovascular uh, aortic paper. It's really more of a, a comparison of um, aortic uh, numbers in the endovascular error. Sorry about that. We have two great uh, special guests who are moderating, Dr. Matthew Smeds, professor of surgery, who is also editor-in-chief of the JBS uh, CIT, he's here um, to help with the, the questions. And then Dr. Merrill Logan, who was a resident with me at, uh, at UC Davis, who's now at the Central Texas Veterans Health System. She's an adjunct assistant professor at Texas A&M. Just a few little uh, housekeeping tips. We ask that you stay muted. Please put your questions and comments in the chat because our moderators will go over those and they may ask you if the question is unclear to unmute. The event is being recorded for on-demand access. And then in November, we will be having uh, Cedar sinai and Indiana University host on November 9th uh, at 7.30 Eastern time. So with that, I'll stop sharing and we will turn it over. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Humphreys, for the introduction. And I'll go ahead and get us started here with a brief introduction into the carotid paper that, uh, as uh, Misty mentioned, Dr. Amir Gafirian, our fifth year integrated vascular surgery resident, is going to discuss in more detail. Um, just starting off with a little bit of background, as, as we know, there's about 795,000 cases annually of stroke with a prevalence of 2.7% and approximately one stroke every 40 seconds. And when we look at the leading causes of death among both men and women, you can see third among women is stroke and fifth among men. And this, these are numbers as of 2019, but you can look at more recent numbers, uh, which include COVID and obviously COVID has jumped into the top five, but stroke remains uh, the top five as well. Uh, when we think about stroke, we refer to two separate entities, both transient ischemic attacks and stroke with the difference really being the presence of a focal cerebral spinal cord or retinal infarction. And when we think about the underlying etiology of stroke, we can classify stroke into two ways, hemorrhagic and ischemic. And of course, we as vascular surgeons are primarily treating those with large artery atherosclerotic related stroke uh, with especially carotid bulb disease. And the benefit of carotid endarterectomy has been established in numerous trials in both asymptomatic and symptomatic patients. And although the data behind the asymptomatic uh, carotid stenosis benefits may be uh, are being called into question over recent years and being re-examined in, in a lot of ways, the, certainly the benefit of carotid endarterectomy among symptomatic patients with moderate to severe stenosis is very well established. And in many ways, the carotid endarterectomy is the gold standard for 
carotid artery disease is, you know, really one of the best studied surgeries really in the whole discipline uh, of surgery, but certainly in our field specifically. And obviously there are certain factors associated with carotid endarterectomy that raise the risk of the procedure. Those be physiologic and anatomic risk factors, which really brought up the idea of carotid stenting. And, and as we know from the CREST trial, both the short and long-term results, uh, really the, the difference between stenting and endarterectomy in terms of primary composite endpoints when you look out to 10 years, as well as the difference in any stroke really aren't statistically significantly different, although there are some differences in that immediate perioperative period with stroke rates following stenting uh, versus endarterectomy. And we know that there are several factors that raise the risk of stroke with transfemoral carotid stenting, whether that's specific arch types, patients with a lot of atherosclerotic disease, and the reality that distal embolic protection in many cases can't be employed until after you engage in cross the lesion. And so there are certain disadvantages to transfemoral carotid stenting that really lend itself nicely to the, the TCAR, which is a way of kind of combining the benefits of both approaches in order to uh, really optimize uh, optimize the results of the procedure. Obviously, through a small incision in the base, the neck, you gain direct uh, access to the common carotid artery in the T-car, which, as we know, uh, avoids navigation of the uh, aortic arch and allows for direct carotid access. Uh, additionally, the, the, the carotid endarterectomy-like protection of the T-car procedure with clamping and flow reversal prior to engaging the lesion provides extra protection against distal uh, embolization. And the TCAR procedure, ever since its um, first studies in the Roadster trial, has had nothing but great results. Uh, this really is a review of the mostly 141 pivotal patients, but we see they're all stroke rate, stroke and death rate, and stroke death and MI rates are very low and comparable to those initial studies and the initial results in uh, NASA, ACST, and ACAS. And, and certainly after it was commercially approved, in 2016, we can see that the number of TCAR publications per year has remained steady at around 60. And I have no doubt that we're going to continue looking closely at this procedure and defining exactly who and, and where it should be used. I, I just chose a couple of examples randomly. I don't have any personal connection to either of these, but there are a number of studies within our within the journal of vascular surgery, as well as others that have looked at TCAR versus both carotid endarterectomy and transfemoral carotid stenting. And there's some very clear patterns that are coming up regardless of the uh, type of data that's being analyzed. We see that TCAR has similar stroke rates, if not better uh, than uh, carotid endarterectomy with much lower rates of cranial nerve injury, which would make intuitive sense based on the extent of surgical dissection required. And then uh, when you compare tran uh, transcarotid and transfemoral carotid stenting, TCAR has shown much lower rates of stroke as compared to transfemoral carotid stenting. Again, due to the direct access to the carotid artery, the ability to uh, avoid manipulation within the arch, and then of course, uh, the institution of the flow reversal before engaging the lesion. But there are still some questions that remain in the role of TCAR, especially among those patients that have uh, anatomic risk factors that, uh, while certainly raise the risk for not only credit and arterectomy, but some may say would also raise the risk of a TCAR, for example, ipsilateral neck radiation, especially if there are neck uh, and skin changes in the, in the base of the neck at the side of the carotid, uh, direct carotid access. I can speak of one anecdotal experience I've had where I took care of a patient who their skin over their clavicle and into their neck just felt like bark, very firm, woody, with no mobility, right at the side of where our TCAR incision would be. And our group really discussed what would be the best manage the management of this patient and attempted TCAR or transfemoral carotid stent. And this is really where um, today's discussion leads us is to uh, this paper that I'll now turn it over to uh, Dr. Gaffarian, again, our fifth year graduating chief resident to uh, discuss. So with that, I'll stop sharing and pass along to Amir. Thank you very much, Jake. Um, sharing my screen here. All right. Do you guys see the screen okay? We can. Okay, perfect. So um, in introduction to this paper, we know that TCAR uh, was commercially available in 2016 and is considered non-inferior to carotid endarterectomy, as Jake had mentioned. 
Um, the latest SVA, uh, SVS guidelines also have expanded the role of TCAR to be recommended for patients with hostile neck anatomy as less exposure is needed, and it's thus less prone to cranial nerve injury. Um, also, the proximal common carotid artery is not often exposed in a primary CEA, and so there's less scarring there. But nonetheless, there are still relative contraindications to TCAR per the IFU that include cervical stomas, history of neck radiation or ablation, and radical neck dissection. Um, despite this, uh, many people will still do TCARs in hostile necks, and so the outcomes of these, um, of these procedures in this anatomy is not well known, and so this, the purpose of this study was to retrospectively review uh, TCAR outcomes in patients with hostile neck anatomy compared to de novo necks from multiple institutions. Uh, the institutional databases that were reviewed include the Indiana University, the University of Texas Health, and the Associated Memorial Hermann Health System. And patients that were included included those patients who had symptomatic or asymptomatic carotid stenosis that were treated with TCAR. And the stenosis criteria from Indiana University was 80% and 70% for Memorial Hermann Health System. And hostile neck anatomy um, was defined as uh, any patient with a history of uh, radiation, prior CEA, or history of radical oncologic neck dissection. So 750 patients uh, had TCAR between 2015 and 2021. 321 were done at Indiana University and 429 at Memorial Hermann. 108 of these cases were uh, uh, in hostile neck anatomy, 64% uh, had a prior CEA, 14% with prior oncologic neck dissection, and about 31% with prior radiation. And you can see the comorbidities in table one, where there's no difference with exception of arrhythmias being more prevalent in the de novo group, as well as a, a lower ejection fraction. The indications for TCAR are shown in here in table two. Uh, there are no significant differences uh, between the hostile uh, neck group and the de novo group with uh, stenosis, with degree of stenosis, uh, symptomatic uh, status, time to revascularization, the lesion level, and the status of the contralateral uh, carotid. And intraoperatively, they were nearly identical in terms of uh, intraoperative course, with the exception of a slightly longer operative time of six uh, average minutes with the hostile neck uh, patients. Uh, perioperatively, there were no difference in antiplatelet regimen. Um, the de novo patients were more likely to be on anticoagulation, likely due to their higher prevalence of arrhythmias. But um, perioperatively, the stroke, death, and MI uh, rates were not significantly different between both groups. There was no death in the hostile neck group and nine total deaths in the de novo group. Three had died of stroke related to complications prior to their discharge. Uh, one, a delayed stroke on post-op day nine. One had respiratory failure with a subsequent death on post-op day nine, and three had um, uh, MI-associated death uh, within 30 days. Um, you can see here that the cranial nerve palsy rate was low, but not significantly different. Um, and uh, there were 10 total re-interventions, um, nine washouts for a hematoma or abscess, and one patient in the de novo group had a thrombotic event and was converted to a uh, endarterectomy. The follow-up rates were similar between both groups, um, and during follow-up, there's no variability in re-intervention, stem thrombosis, MI, stroke, or death. Um, but however, there was compromised follow-up noted uh, by the authors with 22% loss to follow-up in the hostile neck group and 29% loss to follow-up in the de novo group. So in discussion, um, traditionally patients with hostile neck were preferentially treated with transfemoral stenting, um, but now TCAR provides an alternate, alternate uh, option in these patients with hostile necks, given very little scarring encountered through a TCAR incision in these patients. And and per the authors, only marginally more challenging um, case compared to patients who had de novo neck anatomy. Um, patients with wide field radiation um, are associated with more difficult carotid exposure given the increased skin and soft tissue, thick, tissue thickening and fibrosis. And what the authors describe as a woody common carotid artery, which may benefit from sequential arteri arteriotomy dilation or axis site enlargement with an 11 blade, for example, before inserting the 10 French uh, on route sheath. Uh, the only comparable series on this topic is a 2022 um, VQI study in patients with prior carotid endarterectomy who had a subsequent restenosis. Um, looking at transfemoral stents versus TCAR procedures, 
And in this VTY study, TCAR patients had a high technical success rate, a fluoro time of 11.8 minutes, OR time of 75 minutes, and a 57 cc mean contrast uh, with very low complication rates. Um, which were similar to what this study had showed. But the limitations of this study are that the adverse events of interest uh, were rare, and thus with only 108 T-cars in the comparative group, uh, the study is underpowered. Um, there was also a high loss to follow-up rate, and uh, the retrospective design um, provides information and selection bias. But despite these limitations, the study does confirm many beliefs that TCAR um, in a hostile neck does not significantly increase case complexity um, with similar and good perioperative outcomes that we've seen in all the TCAR studies. And one of the big issues is what's the definition of a hostile neck? Because that definition is very variable and there's different degrees of hostility. Um, for example, a prior CEA or an oncologic dissection um, will probably have less risk of cranial nerve injury or wound healing complications compared to a widespread radiation in a fibrotic neck. And I think other anatomic factors to um, assess when we're looking at neck hostility is uh, morbid obesity and uh, the degree of anterior neck fat and tissue depth, which we've seen here at Harborview several patients who are morbidly obese with very um, uh, thick and um, fatty necks that have uh, difficult angles for access that make um, obviously the TCAR procedure more difficult than, uh, than average. So I think those are the things to consider when um, looking at hostile neck and there's a lot of variability in that. And um, that's all I have. Thank you. Those were, uh, that was a great presentation, Amir. We have, looks like we have a, a question and a comment in the chat so far. So the first question, I would argue that prior CEA does not make a hostile anatomy for TCAR given that the section is lower. So that group should be excluded. So what are the thoughts from the um, presenters and the author on that? I think that's a great point. Um, you know, prior CEA incisions have, are, are obviously more um, are more distal and usually the common carotid, as I had mentioned, is spared and thus that area is not scarred. And so I agree that, you know, that, you know, I don't, I don't agree that that should consider, be considered as a hostile neck, um, but in some patients who might have more lengthy incisions, it could be more scarred down there, but that hasn't been my experience. So Dr. Wang, if you do you know if you excluded prior CEAs, would there have been a, a difference in the outcomes? Yeah, I don't know that off the top of my head, but you know, I, I definitely take that into account. You know, the, the issue with this paper is that we were trying to really kind of look at the recent SVS guidelines, which was which came out in, in 2021 and basically embraced TCAR, not as the first line necessarily, but as as an alternative to patients who had a relative contraindication to um, CEA. And so one of those, obviously one of those contraindications is prior CEA. And so that, that's why we wanted to include these patients, these quote unquote anatomic uh, hostile neck uh, patients. But I think that when you're talking about something like this, I think you have to put the study in perspective or TCAR into perspective. You know, it's important to remember that patients with uh, anatomic high risk for CEA, they don't have a higher risk for post-operative stroke or death. Uh, even after a redo CEA, they have a higher risk of cranial nerve injury and other associated mi more relatively minor um, complications. So it doesn't take them out of your equation in terms of performing a redo CEA or anything along those lines. But I think you have to consider, you know, what your alternatives are, whether it's going to be TCAR, transfemoral stenting. Obviously, transfemoral stenting is a little bit more of a heavy decision compared to the other things that we're choosing here. Thanks. Um, looks like another comment in the chat. Uh, hostile neck and 70% asymptomatic and nine deaths with 10 reintervention. You have to question the indication. Any comment on that? Yeah, I'll make a quick comment. I'll, uh, and I'll, um, you know, maybe we can open up for discussion. I mean, certainly this is a hot topic right now. There's a really excellent review from coming from, uh, I think, JAMA Neurology a couple of uh, about a year or two ago looking at uh, whether we should be intervening at all in asymptomatic patients. And I don't necessarily disagree with that in the age of better antiplatelets, anticoagulation, and statins. But at the end of the day, we have to go to our society and our society of vascular surgery, carotid recommendations, still recommending 70% asymptomatic patients. 
And so, you know, where I was a fellow at Indiana, we kind of just threw that out of the window and said, you know, we're not going to intervene on 70% and we'll just wait for 80%. So that's end diastolic velocity greater than 125 and additional peak systolic greater than 230. And so, you know, that was kind of our reaction to the better medical management you know, uh, argument, but you know, when you go back to this side, this is 2021 recommendations. We're still recommending 70% asymptomatic. I think at the end of the day, we have to go to the root and, and see what the, we're going to do from that perspective. Um, another question in light of previous randomized control trials and hostile necks, um, this article shows similar high risk and ongoing CREST2 trials. Should this technique be limited to clinical efficacy trials? Um, I don't know if Toby Richards wants to elaborate on that himself. Sorry, hi, good morning. Calling from Australia. Um, I'm Toby Richards, I'm Director of Clinical Trials. I participated in, or I ran the European Crotal Surgery Trial where we risk stratified patients, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, to interventional optimized medical therapy. Um, I could, I'm, a, I'm actually just about to go into work to do two carotids this morning, so I'm not against carotids, but um, I do question the advances of technology in this setting when we have a very, very good operation called a carotid endarterectomy. Um, and so, Retrospective trials showing that we can do it doesn't necessarily mean we should do it. And I read this manuscript and I look at the high complication rates and I have to question, were we doing the right operation in the first place? And if you go back into the literature, the 2008 long-term follow-up of stenting versus carotid endarterectomy trial showed a similar high risk for intervention in these patients and that at that time, and for those of you like me who might be old enough to remember it, um, did actually significantly would uh, lower the rates of reintervention for carotid disease. Um, and history always has a habit of repeating itself. And I just wonder if uh, our enthusiasm is uh, is pushing us a little bit too far in these high risk patients. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think the 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 issue really is we are not recommending TCA. We're In fact, we are a carotid endarterectomy first institution. We just happen to be doing a lot of carotid surgery. So it seems like we're, we're pushing hard. There's a lot of publications out there looking at TCAR just because we don't understand it very well. And most of it's just small institutional series or data from the VQI, right? But I, I think you have to caution yourself in a little bit with what we have because I, I, my suspicion is that the rate complications reported in the VQI were associated with TCAR is significantly underreported because a lot of the data that we're getting from VQI is in hospital data. And if you look at our institutional stuff, about a third of deaths and a third of strokes occur after hospital discharge when you're talking about carotid surgery. And so I think we're underreporting, and I think there's a big push towards making TCAR a, a, a carotid first kind of intervention, but that's not something I, I agree with at all. I think you have to select for the right patients, and I think you have to select for a patient that's not a candidate for carotid endarterectomy. From the data that we have, we cannot say that TCAR is uh, better than carotid endarterectomy, like, like um, you know, we discussed earlier. There's nothing better studied than carotid endarterectomy, at least in our field, right? And so these are patients who are bad candidates for carotid endarterectomy. These are, I think these are the patients that you want to consider. With the data that we have, we can't make that recommended, recommendation that TCAR is better or should be considered first when T, carotid endarterectomy is a good, good option for that patient. Uh, this is Misty Humphreys, and it's interesting what you just said. We um, have our neurology group come and give a lecture on treatments for um, our vascular residents. And in the lecture, when it came to TCAR, the neurology team said there's really not enough evidence to show that it is a first line treatment. And that's from their own literature. So I think it's kind of interesting how so many of us have adopted it, but um, they still feel that it's not a first line treatment. And I see Ron Dahlman has his hand up too. I can't hear Ron.
Do you have some headphones maybe you need to put in? There's a little carrot next to the, the thing, okay. Maybe he can type his question in the chat. Yeah. Does anybody else have a question real quick why Dr. Dolman is, is putting his into the chat? Dr. Wang, what does your group feel about, what does your neurology team feel about while we're waiting on Dr. Dahlman? Do no, I, I, these comments? Yeah, we would echo what, what you're hearing too. You know, there's just not enough data. And everything that comes out that's being published, I think a lot of it, like I said earlier, is we just don't understand a lot with TCAR. But if you look at the papers, they're, they're just different ways to slice VQI, right? And so when Roadster 2 came out, that was really kind of a refreshing take on things because it's a different kind of population, but it's also a highly selected population. But when you're when you're looking at real world data, I don't think you can make any kind of recommendations, whether it's TCAR or CA. The, the problem is we're just never going to know because you're going to need a randomized control trial and you're going to need too many patients and too much money to get that done. And that's I think I think uh, is that better, Misty? Yeah, uh, better. You I just wanted to highlight that, you know, Ali Abarama led the crowded guidelines update this last year. And for all of the, you know, published multi-center TCAR data they still felt there wasn't sufficient uh, evidence available to understand exactly how TCAR fits in the algorithm, let alone TCAR first approach. So I really appreciate this discussion because I think it's right on point. All right, well, that's that's a nice way for us to transition. I think um, I see Dr. Sarfati, so we'll transition over to the paper from Stanford and we'll let you take it away. Thank you, Misty. Let me share my screen. Okay, is that all coming through? So, so the next paper uh, addresses a problem that's of particular importance to those of us involved in training vascular surgeons. Um, and just to set the stage, um, we know that the management of abdominal aortic aneurysm has evolved over the past several decades. Um, EVAR was introduced in the early 1990s and rapidly became the preferred and most commonly uh, used treatment for aortic, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, and that has resulted in increased utilization of EVAR and a coincident decrease in the number of open aortic uh, aneurysm surgeries. And uh, this evolution has raised concerns about whether we have enough open aortic surgery to train vascular surgeons. Um, just one example of available data, this is Medicare claims data um, out of a study done at Dartmouth. Um, if you, on the uh, vertical axis, uh, the number of repairs done in the thousands, and then on the horizontal axis, uh, dates between 2003 and 2013. And you can see that the number of EVARs has steadily increased by about 67% over that time period. And there was a coincident fall in the number of open uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm repairs during that time period. And then also of note, um, for a variety of reasons, the total number of repairs decreased by almost a third during that period of time. And there's uh, uh, different ideas on why why that has occurred, but the overall number of repairs has gone down, and uh, the increase in EVAR and decrease in open repairs has just raised this concern about whether we have enough cases to train vascular surgeons. Um, and just that concern has borne out. If you look at data, this is data from ACGME case logs, um, and uh, vertical axis, the average number of procedures performed per trainee per year, and then along the horizontal axis dates between 1999 and 2008, so that same period of time uh, that we referenced in the previous slide. And during that time period, you can see a steady increase in the number of EVARs and, uh, not surprisingly, uh, a decrease in open aneurysm repairs. Um, 
this this uh, phenomenon has increased even more with the advent of fenestrated branched endografts, just increasing the number of patients that have uh, anatomy that's now suitable for endovascular repair. Uh, the number of open repairs has has continued to fall. Um, a, a, a number of uh, proposed solutions to this shortage in open uh, aortic surgery. Um, a bunch of different things have been proposed to try to, to deal with this shortfall. Um, one is uh, open aortic surgery fellowships, so just extending training uh, for those who did not receive adequate training during their vascular surgery fellowship. There's proposals for uh, doing additional open aortic surgical training, um, consolidation of care at regional aortic centers, um, high fidelity simulation training, um, a, you know, an idea to try to maximize um, educational benefit for each case. So having multiple trainees scrub in, uh, double scrub cases, just trying to maximize the educational benefit of each of these cases. And then um, having, having trainees involved in other types of surgery that don't exactly duplicate open aortic uh, reconstruction, but uh, allow some uh, uh, ability to learn how to expose, uh, expose the aorta. So things like anterior spine exposure or uh, retroperitoneal tumor resections, things like that. Um, the paper out of Stanford has taken a, kind of a unique approach to trying to solve this problem. And uh, they're sending a, a signal that maybe things are not as dire as uh, was once thought. So with that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Ethan Rosenfeld. He's a first year vascular surgery fellow at University of Utah, and he's gonna discuss the paper. Uh, so go ahead, take it away, Ethan. All right, thank you, Dr. Sarfati. Do I need to unshare? I think so. It's not letting me share my screen. Oh, sorry. Here you go. All right. Uh, good evening, and thank you all for the opportunity to participate in this month's JBS Journal Club. My name is Ethan Rosenfeld, and I'm a first year vascular surgery fellow at the University of Utah. And tonight I'll be presenting the article entitled Trends in Annual Open Abdominal Aortic Surgical Volumes for Vascular Trainees Compared with Annual National Volumes in the Endovascular Era. This work was done at Stanford with Dr. Elizabeth George as first author and Dr. Jason Lee as senior author. As mentioned, advances in techniques and technology have allowed the proliferation of EVAR over the past three decades to the point now where over 80% of elective AAAs and over 50% of ruptured AAAs are managed endovascularly. The corresponding decrease in proportion of open AAA repairs has raised concerns about whether contemporary vascular surgeons will be afforded adequate experience and training to achieve competence to perform open AAA repair in the future. However, as the authors of this paper observe, open abdominal aortic reconstruction for occlusive disease shares many technical similarities with open AAA repair, and participation in these cases may provide transferable operative skills for trainees. Trends in case volume and trainee experience with open aortic reconstruction for occlusive disease, uh, however, to this point, are not well documented. Therefore, the authors of this paper sought to examine how globally increasing EVAR adoption has affected contemporary open abdominal aortic surgical experience, including both repairs for aneurysm and occlusive disease for vascular surgery trainees. This was a retrospective observational cohort study, and the time period evaluated in the study was from 2006 to 2017. Estimates of national case volume for open abdominal aortic surgery including both for AAA and for aortoiliac occlusive disease were derived from the national inpatient sample using ICD-9 and 10 procedure codes. Within this NIS data set, teaching hospitals were identified as those having one or more residency programs at the hospital. 
graduating vascular surgery resident and fellow case volumes for open abdominal aortic surgeries were determined using publicly available ACGME case logs uh, using CPT codes. There were two primary outcomes for the study. First, the authors examined temporal trends in national case volume for open AAA repair, open aortoiliac occlusive uh, disease reconstructions, and total open aortic surgeries as estimated from the NIS. Next, the authors similarly examined temporal trends in graduating vascular surgery fellow and resident case volume for open AAA repair, open uh, aortoiliac occlusive disease reconstructions, and total open aortic surgeries as identified in the ACGME case log system. Secondary outcomes of the study included the proportion of open aortic cases performed at teaching hospitals as identified in the NIS, and the effect of the addition of vascular surgery residency programs on vascular surgery fellow open aortic surgery uh, case volumes. This was accomplished by comparing vascular surgery fellow case volumes from the era before integrated residency trainees had become senior residents, uh, so from 2006 to 2011, to the time period after the first integrated residents had become senior residents, uh, that being 2012 to 2017, and had theoretically begun to affect fellow case volumes. Turning to the results, addressing the first primary outcome, the study found that over the 12 year time period examined, the volume of total open aortic surgeries performed annually in the United States decreased by 72% from an estimated 24,000 cases in 2006 to 6,600 cases in 2017. Estimates of national annual open AAA repairs decreased by 84% from 18,000 in 2006 to 2,800 in 2017. And estimated open aortoiliac occlusive disease reconstructions decreased by 33% uh, from 5,600 in 2006 to 2,850 in 2017. During the study time period, the percentage of all open aortic cases performed at teaching hospitals significantly increased, uh, as shown in this figure here. The percentage of annual cases performed at teaching hospitals in the US increased from 55 to 84% for open AAA repairs, from 55% to 78% for open aortoiliac occlusive disease reconstructions, and from 55 to 80% for all open aortic surgeries. The number of graduating fellows stayed relatively steady during the study time period. Comparing graduating vascular surgery fellow case volumes from 2006 to 2017, the average number of open AAA repairs decreased by 40% from 19 uh, to an average of 11. Conversely, the average number of open aortoiliac occlusive disease reconstructions increased by 66% from 9 to 15. In total, average open aortic surgeries only decreased by 7% uh, from an average of 28 to 26 cases. Looking at integrated residents, since the first graduating class in 2013, the average number of open AAA repairs has remained constant at around 10. There has also been an increasing volume of open aortoiliac occlusive disease reconstructions uh, in this group uh, with an increase in the average case number from 11 to 17 cases. In total, average open aortic surgeries for vascular residents have increased by 31% uh, from 23 to 30 cases. Finally, while there was an absolute decrease in total open aortic case volume for vascular surgery fellows, the rate of decline in total open aortic surgeries and open AAA repairs for fellows did not differ uh, between the time periods before and after vascular surgery residencies were established in graduating their, their residents. There are some limitations of this study, which the authors discuss. Uh, from 2012 onwards, NIS includes a 20% sample of discharges from all hospitals and may not capture an entire hospital's uh, set of discharges, which could result in an underestimate of total aortic cases at a given hospital. Uh, also, the NIS definition of a teaching hospital uh, changed during the study period and also does not specify whether a teaching hospital included a vascular surgery training program. And finally, um, there's an acknowledgement that there's variability in uh, trainee case logging habits uh, which could affect uh, the um, accuracy of, the num of those numbers. In, to summarize, during the study, peri study time period from 2006 to 2017, the overall incidence of open aortic surgery has decreased nationally with an increased proportion of cases occurring at teaching hospitals. For vascular surgery trainees, 
While open AAA procedures have been declining with increasing EVAR use, open reconstructions for aortoiliac occlusive disease have been increasing. Finally, even with an expanding trainee pool with the addition of integrated vascular surgery residents, annual open aortic volumes at teaching hospitals has remained adequate to meet minimum graduation requirements for all trainees. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention. And thanks once again for the opportunity to participate in this journal club. Um, so I'll open up the discussion. I thought that was um, a really nice uh, discussion of this paper. And I thought this paper was a very interesting paper. There's been some discussion in the chat box, um, kind of focusing on how many aortic operations do our trainees need to become facile, you know, in the procedure. And so I kind of open this up to the crowd. What do you guys think? How many do you need to be able to do an aortic operation? Is 10 enough? Is 20 enough? Do you need more? Um, any thoughts, Dr. Dahlman? What are your thoughts on that? So, Misty, is that just out of a hat, or what's your what's the justification for that number? So, there's a lot of discussion that shows that you need to do something, you know, sometimes 50 times to become good at it but I think they need to do at least 20 as a minimum to be able to have the experience with some of the variety that can come up and actually being able to um, troubleshoot whenever they're in there. The first time they're probably just saying, look at me, I'm sewing. The second couple of times they're really doing the exposure. So I think they need to repeat it. And I would say at least 20. One of the, if you want to consider a radical proposal at the first meeting we had of this ACGME uh, writing committee was, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, was that maybe not every vascular surgeon needs to be uh, competent and meet training requirements for every procedure that vascular surgeons perform. And in fact, maybe the future of board certification is going to be component certification, acknowledging the fact that not everybody needs or wants or is going to have exposure to every facet of vascular surgery training. I, I realize it's kind of a, unusual from our current perspective, but I'm, I'm, this might be a good opportunity for those of us who are participating in this process to get some feedback on that idea. Ron, how does, how does the ACGME come up with the minimum case numbers? What, what's the process? Uh, it's set, honestly, at the 10th percentile of the average. Okay. That's the minimum. That's that's the bottom line. That's how they do it. I mean, I think one problem with component training, like how do you deal with call? You have like an aortic guy who's on call and you have a endo guy. It's I think it just creates some issues there as well. Well, you know, you have to balance that. Again, I don't want to, I'm sorry. I'm going to step back here just a minute, but I want to just respond initially by saying that, you know, on the other hand, we have this, worsening shortage of vascular specialists nationwide. And it's very hard to drive that pipeline if everybody has to be good at everything with a diminishing number of these complex case experiences. So, you know, another facet on this, you'll remember Dr. Uh, Macaroon had proposed a few years ago, this vascular surgery light. It was mostly like general surgeons could get board board acknowledgement for special competence and like dialysis access or something. This is a slightly different proposal where there's a single training platform and a kind of a minimum training requirement for vascular surgeons. And then either during initial training or at later times, they could add separate kind of certifications for skill sets. Um, without you know being able to predict exactly the direction the specialty or society will evolve. This seemed to be one way to meet the man or person power issues, um, you know, while, while, you know, also helping people streamline their time required and training, et cetera, to, to become independent in practice. So, I mean, there's a lot, that's why we're talking about it. You know, along the same lines, I wonder what percentage of surgeons who go out into practice uh, stay current and continue to do open aortic surgery. Um, and so, you know, maybe like what you're saying, maybe that, that they don't really even need to, to know how to do it uh, at the expert level. I have a question for uh, Dr. George, um, the author on this paper. Uh, 
do you uh, think it was fair to include surgeon junior resident cases for the resident analysis rather than just focusing on you know kind of senior um, experiences? That's a fair uh, question. I, uh, in my personal experience, I feel like I gained a lot as a third year trainee as well um, from doing these cases. Often uh, some of our uh, institutions, we are uh, the third year chief um, and get to do these cases as the, as the um, primary trainee um, participating in the case. So I do think that was, um, uh, I do think it was valuable to include those, but to your point, it is kind of one of the limitations that it, for, it, if the junior trainee is an intern, they won't be getting as much out of the case um, as, as a third year and won't be getting as much case out of a fifth year or a fellow. To Dr. Humphrey's point, you need to do it. First, you're doing the sewing, then you're doing the exposure, then you're doing the retraction and all that. It it's a stepwise learning curve. And again, to, Dr. to kind of others who have alluded to this, one of, uh, one of the, the, the sort of the thing, big things that I looked at when I was um, looking for a job and as a new faculty member was making sure that I had senior partners that would be able to kind of help me and be there as because as the education, I completely agree, does not stop on June 30th when I completed my residency training. It is, is absolutely ongoing. So I think it, that will be an incredibly important part of my development as a junior faculty member as I am embarking on my open cases as the as faculty. Yeah, I will say that's, that's critical when you're looking for a new job for all the trainees out there is to find supportive uh, partners who are kind of willing to step up and help you when you, when you need help and get into trouble. I also wonder, um, Dr. George, you know, if you were able to look at variation amongst the centers rather than just averages, because I wonder if this is saying that we actually have more of a problem on our hands than we realize, because, you know, with centers of excellence, excellence and, and certain centers doing a lot more of these, I wonder if these numbers are kind of skewed in the wrong direction in that we have a small number of residents getting a large experience and then most of our residents not really getting a great experience with open aortic surgery. Were you able to kind of look at the variation amongst the centers or was it just kind of average, just raw averages? It's, unfortunately, it's raw averages on the national level. It's these are nationally weighted estimates. Um, it gives you raw numbers and then you apply a weighted average. Um, the, uh, one of the limitations because of the way the data is collected is you can't, we don't actually have center level data in the national, uh, in the NIS. Um, kind of the real powerful analysis would be pairing a kind of VQI data to these ACGME case logs and really getting at the data um, on a more granular level, if per, perhaps by partnering with the APDBS in order to really look at where the deficits are in terms of uh, from a regional or center level standpoint of, of where, the, where the lower case volumes are coming from. There's some discussion in the chat box about um some level of surprise with an increase in open surgery for aeroiliac occlusive disease with all the advanced endovascular options that are available. Um, anybody have any thoughts on why we might be seeing that? Nobody. Dr. George, do you wanna, do you wanna maybe comment? Sure, I think um, from a, uh, just in terms of open uh, perspective, our, as, you, as uh, Dr. Logan said, the, the technology is absolutely getting better, but as again, it kind of took, took my punchline away, I don't think everyone has actually adopted CRAV. And I think from a comfort level standpoint, despite kissing iliacs and kind of iliac stenting having great patency, when you get up into the aorta, I think the patency is for, um, uh, for an aorta biofem is, is probably going to be better. So um, I, I think from that standpoint, I think adoption of if, if sort of diffusion of that techno technology has not reached as widespread as say a basic EVAR is for aneurysmal disease. So I think the diffusion curves of that technology are, are different. You know, and I, I agree. I do love a good aorta biofem. <laughs> you know, I wonder um, if it's an issue or a benefit that the trainees are getting exposed to complex aortic operations rather than a lot of chip shot open aortas. Um, so on the one hand, it's a benefit that they're going to be seeing these really complex cases because those are the kind of cases anymore that they're going to have to open do an open operation on. So they're, they're, they're actually doing the cases that they need to know how to do uh, rather than just getting a bunch of chip shot open aortas, which they'll never see kind of in practice. Um, let's see, any other questions here? Um, 
you know, Misty, Paul, any other questions? Great paper, important topic. Um, well presented. No, I think uh, I think there's a lot to unpack with this. You know, we actually discussed this at our own journal club, and then discussing it here, and just you know, the trainees have a very unique perspective about how much they want to to be comfortable, and then I think as faculty or as in practice as partners, we want them to also come in and and be able to do some of this. But I do think that as they said in the the chat training doesn't end when your residency ends. I'm still learning things every single day. Some di some days it's good things, some days it's bad. <laughs> Couldn't agree right. with you more. <laughs> Plus, we love scrubbing with our partners. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things is to scrub with my partners because they are moving sometimes just as fast as lightning. Like, and I, and I love that. So, well, I think we will be able to end a little bit early. We had a lot of great discussion. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and we will be back November 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern time, and we will have two uh, the um, two new articles presented by Indiana University and Cedar sinai So thank you, everyone, and have a great night.